good evening, everyone, to the audience, and welcome to our candidates here for the debate we're having in Ward 5 for the City Council election on November 7. That ward appears on the screen behind the candidates there. That That's the area that if you live in that area, you're going to want to decide which of these two you're going to vote for. So let's find out some things. Um, I want to thank SPNN for hosting tonight, uh, for having this uh, important educational forum so that the voters make informed choices on Election Day or the early voting that's underway right now. Uh, my name is Andy Dawkins. I was a state legislator for 15 years in the Rondo and the Frogtown neighborhoods. I uh, was an unsuccessful candidate for mayor in 1993. And my co-moderator? Uh, my name is Abu Naeem. I'm a former St. Paul City Council candidate for Ward 1, and I'm currently a board member for the Hamlin Midway Coalition. I'd like to also explain St. Paul Strong. We've got our placard up right over here, but uh, we believe as a group uh, in nonpartisanship, we don't pick candidates, but we believe in transparency and accountability in city government. We're not going to have any opening statements tonight. Uh, we're going to alternate who answers the questions first that I'm going to ask, and Mr. Naeem is going to ask. Um, but I want to uh, really thank you both for having uh, taken the time to do some thoughtful responses to the questionnaires that we sent out in advance. And I want to let the audience know that you can go to St. Paul Strong, that's one word, dot com. St. Paul Strong, all spelled out, but uh, including S-A-I-N-T for St. Paul. And look at the responses these people gave. And keep in mind that we have two candidates that didn't bother to fill out those questionnaires that aren't willing to be here to be transparent and accountable for what they believe in and what that, why you should vote for them. So um, we will start with the uh, first question, and it's going to be a question that uh, I will ask Ms. Tolleson. So you've just knocked on my door. You've got 20 seconds to tell me why I should vote for you. 20 seconds to why I should vote for you. Go ahead. Hi, my name's Pam Tollefson, and I'm running for city council. I've been door knocking since March. My big goal is to hear everybody's views and your, uh, what you have as problems. I'm here because I care. I, I want to do the right thing. I want to be able to hear you. And... I want to make sure that our city government is transparent. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. Hi, my name is David Greenwood Sanchez, and I'm here. Um, I'm a longtime resident of St. Paul, originally from Como, and I've lived here most of my life. And I'm really concerned with the direction that our city is headed. Um, we have all of these projects that don't represent the values of our community. We're not able to repair our roads. We're not able to shovel our streets. We're not listening fundamentally to the needs of regular people like you and myself. So I'm fighting to bring in a real voice Thank into you. our city. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez, a question for you. You're out visiting relatives in rural Minnesota, and your uncle asks you, why do you like living in St. Paul? And this one doesn't have a time limit? No. Yes, all right. So. St. Paul is a fantastic city. We have great natural resources here. You know, if you like the outdoors, we have the Mississippi River. We have caves alongside the Mississippi River. We have parks. We have great clean air. We're close to a lot of uh, things immediately surrounding the city. And on top of it, we have lovely people. And I think that St. Paul, one of our strengths is that we have diversity, diversity of thought, diversity in our communities, and that's changing for the better. So there's a lot to love about St. Paul. Thank you. And Ms. Towson. I love St. Paul because it has many historic buildings that are so wonderful to uh, visit and to see. We recognize the libraries. We have beautiful lakes. We have Como. We have Lake Phelan. Both have great parks. And as David, yes. as I'm saying, there's so many diversity. There's so many different cultures. And it's really a great city to live in. Thank you. Starting with Ms. Tollefson. Uh, what is the least favorite thing about living in St. Paul? The least thing that I don't like is that I think that the city council and the city in general, they're not listening to people. So many residents have complaints and they're not being heard. They call their uh, city council representatives and they tell me that they don't get phone calls back. I don't think that people are heard. And then of course they're big, ideal projects that they have instead of taking care of our maintaining our roads and sidewalks and snow plowing and the things that we need to be a thriving city. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. 
So I'm going to second Pam's point there and say that the most frustrating thing about St. Paul is that we don't have voice. We don't really have that connection. I think there's nothing that's more frustrating to a resident, someone who's putting in their time trying to contribute to the city to make it better, than to feel like you're getting shut out. And I think that that happens across the political spectrum, whether you're on the, the right, on the left, in the middle, we have exactly that situation where people are talking, but they're not getting heard. And again, there's nothing more frustrating than seeing projects that go up in your community that are affecting you, your day-to-day -day life, and you don't have a say in them. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez, tell me and my co-moderator, Mr. Naeem, uh, something from your gut that tells us that you get it about racism? Hmm. You know, I'm not sure how to, how to answer that with one single thing because it's, you know, it's such, for me, I see it as a, it's your entire life. It's a, a set of lived experiences of you being in a place of really, you know, seeing people, of talking to different people, understanding it, and, you know, in my case, I guess the closest that I have, it's, it's different, but I'm, I'm Peruvian, I'm Peruvian Minnesota, I'm Peruvian Minnesotan, um, and I see things in you know, a slightly different way. I have my own perspective from having uh, a mother from Peru, from having my family in Peru, and I don't experience necessarily the same type of racism that I think we're most used to, but I do definitely feel and I'm sensitive to that idea of like, what it means to sometimes see things from the outside or from being uh, you know, a, a different group. Ms. Tolleson. I will never be able to understand what people experience with racism, but I know I understand what they're feeling. Years ago, my cousin had um, two children with an African-American man, and these little boys went to my uncle, which was the grandfather, and he ignored them. He totally ignored them, mm. and he kept saying, Grandpa, and you know what, that was, 40 years ago, mm. and that will never, I'll never forget that. Mm. And so for me, again, I cannot ever experience racism because I'm not, I'm white, um, but I'll, I'll never forget that. Thank you. All right, starting with uh, Ms. Tallison, uh, tell me and Mr. Dawkins uh, that you, how do you show that you deeply understand poverty and inequity? Well, I see it. I see people that have no money. Um, there were times when I was in my 20s where I had no money. I had a mom and dad, and I always knew I could fall back on somebody, but I had too much pride to ask. But there were times when at, sometimes I had 10 check cashing checks out to pay bills, okay? So I did have parents that I could fall back on, but no, a lot of people don't. They have nobody. And I understand that panic of how am I gonna pay my water bill when that water guy is out there on your sidewalk getting ready to turn off your water. So um, I do understand poverty, and that's a brief description of it. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. So again, poverty is multifaceted. It's experienced differently by different communities, and I can speak from my own experience. I, you know, grew up in a kind of a middle-class family, but I've, you know, made my way through the ranks with getting merit scholarships to go to university. Uh, for my uh, same goes for my master's degree and for my um, my PhD. On top of it, you know, I spent some time in Chile working with a group called Poverty Action Lab. It has a different, um, in general, I mean, the, the idea behind it. For those of you who don't know, it's. Uh, trying to evaluate different anti-poverty programs in well, across the world using randomized evaluation. And one of my issues with them is that, in a way, the conceptualization of poverty was rather restricted. It was more in terms of economics and the way that economists look at it. And again, if you have a different understanding of what poverty looks at, looks like, uh, it's very multidimensional and it's experienced differently by different communities at different moments in time. Thank you. Uh Mr. Greenwood Sanchez, what was the last volunteer activity you engaged in? Hmm. Let me think. <laughs> Give me a second to think. I'm trying to rack my brain for it. Um, 
I'm going to pass. I'm kind of blinking on it. In Ms. Tallison. I would have to say probably when my mom and dad were still alive, I uh, took part in their at church, the monthly Wednesday lunches for all the senior citizens that people were in their 90s. And I would just uh, serve food and just be there for them. And I think that was the prop that was in 2020. Okay, thank you. So, so starting with Ms. Tollefson, uh, who has been a role model for you? Well, personal or, I mean, anybody. Truthfully, my mom, I know it's a uh, cliche, but my mom was very involved in um, her way of being involved with politics. And even when she was in her late 80s, she'd say, I'm calling Mayor Carter's office. I'm, I'm calling his office. Well, I didn't get a hold of Mayor Carter, but his assistant called me back. And she wanted the east side and the city to be the best it can be. And she felt empathy for the underdog, always. And I was kind of, that's kind of who I am. I always will have a, a soft spot for underdogs. So my mom is my, my hero. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. I'm gonna borrow from Pam and also I have to say my mom, number one, first and foremost, um, who's really given me the values to, to stand up for what I believe in um, and also a good toolkit to be able to do what I need to do. Beyond that, uh, I'm going to mention a shout out to my violin teacher, Eva Buyak, who uh, taught me violin for over 10 years. Uh, and on top of it, a lot of values that come from and discipline that come from uh, studying music. Uh, and then I'll add in um, a former boss of mine named Alejandro Argumedo in Peru who works in the Potato Park and who gave me a different way of, of seeing things. Thank you. The next question is a two-part question. Um, I want to know how you're advantaging ranked choice voting as you go about knocking on doors and looking for votes in this election. But I want to couch that in that, do you think that uh, we have a problem in St. Paul with being a one-party town? I think the question is this time, who starts this one? Greenwood Sanchez. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. So I'll start with the, the second question first. So I mean, do we have a problem with being a one party town? Absolutely. I mean, you look at it right now. There are seven council members. Every council member is a member of the same political party. Our mayor is uh, also a member of that political party. And on top of it, when you think about it, as a I'm a political scientist and I look at this and you say, you know, there's something a little bit fishy about this. There's not a lot of incentives in place for people to stick their neck out, to stand up for different things that they believe in. There's not really a good system for creating accountability when you have just one party that runs things and when people have the same, really the incentives not to, um, really not to rub people the, the wrong way because you know that in the future you're gonna be engaging with them in some capacity. Uh, and so that's really deeply problematic. Um, beyond that, uh, so for the first part of the question, it's how are we perceiving, how are we using rank choice? Um, in my case, what I've been doing is when I run into people while door knocking who are a little bit on the fence and they sometimes they explain that, yeah, they've got another candidate in mind or they're kind of torn between two people. I mention that, hey, we have rank choice voting. I also use it for people who just in general are thinking about, all right, we, you know, we have rank choice, but they don't know what it means. And so I try to do my best to explain it to them really quickly. Because again, it's a relatively new concept that's being played out. And my, my suspicion is that we don't, across the city, we don't have a true, fant a fantastic way of understanding how it operates. Thank you. And Ms. Tallison. For ranked choice, um, it's hard to explain to people. I have come to the conclusion. Um, I usually get the answer, well, I'm just going to vote number one. And even though it, it should be quite simple to put someone down first choice or second choice, but I think it's good to always bring up the conversation if the conversation is going in the direction of that. Um, as far as the uh, one party town, it's terrible, to be honest with you. Um, this is what I hear. I'm out door knocking, and I'm not trying to, you know, say I work harder than anybody else, but I feel I have to work harder than anybody else, or 
my DFL endorsed opponent. I have to because I don't have the $100,000 or $50,000 in my account that is given. I don't have a team of the DFL people working together for all the candidates. And I think it does a disservice to the so many people that are, would make great candidates and make good city council people when they're constantly being, who's the DFL endorsed candidate? Um, I wish that we didn't have any endorsements, to be honest with you. Thank you. So uh, Ms. Kim, not here tonight, uh, hiding behind her DFL label, thinks that's just going to be enough. I'm so glad that you're running. I'm so glad there's going to be competition out there. And to the audience, I want to explain that um, if Ms. Kim, as the DFL endorsed candidate, does not get 50% plus one on the first count through of their votes, they're going to look to who is the fourth place finisher in the four person race. And if that person's vote had that candidate as their first vote, but it had a second vote for someone here, maybe, um, it could be that the second place, the second position that you put on your ballot, who you wanted after your first choice, is going to get the difference to get somebody over 50%. So pay attention to go out there and rank the candidates in terms of how you see them, in terms of who you want to be uh, Rank one, two, three, or four for this race. Thank you. Okay, uh, is it your turn? Yes. Uh, this is directed to Ms. Tollison. Uh, is your neighborhood safe, and what makes a safe neighborhood? My neighborhood, my neighborhood is safe. Um, what makes a safe neighborhood to me is when people know each other, and they are able to discuss things that they see, I met with a woman yesterday that lives on the east side, and I thought the neighborhood was actually probably not so safe. We sat and talked for over a half hour. I know it's not good when you're door, no, door knocking to talk so long, but we had a great conversation. And she said that she pointed out every house, and she said, we all talk, and they meet, and they talk about if anything's going on in the neighborhood. So what makes the neighborhood safe to me is when people can um, know their neighbors and that keeps crime out, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. I'll second that. And so, I mean, community cohesion, uh, I think that's number one in my neighborhood. So I'm uh, right on the south side of Como Lake. Um, and yeah, I'd say, relatively speaking, we're a pretty safe neighborhood. Some, in some ways, that's changed recently. We have some things that I, I think everybody's heard of, theft of catalytic converters. Uh, increasingly, towards our area, we even have these cases of, of copper getting taken out of uh, street signs. Um, and so some, to some degree, it's, you know, it's moving in, and you could feel like, hey, things are getting a little bit different. But in general, I'd characterize our, our neighborhood as, as pretty safe. Um, Beyond that, I'd say that historically, you know, there were other types of relations beyond just relations with community, but also with your like local police officer. Um, and we don't have a lot of that any longer. And I, you know, I couldn't tell you who our local police officer is who goes through the area. And so I think that there are different understandings of how to, you know, create that type of engagement between uh, policing and community. But I haven't seen a lot of that in my immediate neighborhood. Thank you. This next question is a <clears throat> kind of a nuanced question. So listen carefully. How will you work to reconcile that people living, the reality that people living in different parts of the city have had different lived experiences regarding public safety? How will you work for solutions that are citywide, inclusive, and reflect the multiple lived experiences? I start this one, right? Yeah. I think the only way to do it is to have real systems in place that are participatory. And so you have to have ways of bringing together people together from these diverse communities and really being able to speak your mind. Um, I don't see that. I think that right now, the way that our city is set up, we have different organizations that represent people. We don't have great spaces for what, you know, I use the term meaningful engagement. Meaningful engagement with communities in order to actually have real people you know, get their voice across um, and be able to talk about things that are important to them. And so, you know, to some extent, that's still leaving it in the abstract, but 
what I'd like to, to get at is the idea that we need to actually bring some of these down to earth and, and really uh, create different spaces where we can have this type of meaningful engagement. Thank you, Ms. Towson. So every summer, the police, St. Paul police, do the safe city nights. I've went to several this summer. And what I find amazing is when I go to McDonough projects and uh, housing, I should call them, um, and the police have such an amazing, they have hot dogs and they have trucks and all the children that live there um, come in, they're talking to the officers. And I think we uh, really need to, to teach our young children to not be afraid. And, and, then, and of course, officers need to show a little bit of tenderness knowing that they are coming from a different place. Um, I know that there's many people that don't trust officers, and that's something that we just have to keep uh, working on, and I met with the police, and I know that they are constantly working on the situation you're talking about. So I, I, I believe we're really heading in a good direction. Thank you. Starting with uh, Ms. Tollison, what have you personally done to curb gun violence, and what will you do once elected? Well, personally, I don't have anything to do with guns, I'm going to be honest, um, but I did just join the Moms um, Take Action. I met them when I was at an event this summer, and I uh, was on a Zoom with the Chief of Police. We were t talking about the uh, laws about keeping your gun safe, and especially in your vehicle. So that's something that I really want to keep promoting, keep pushing. We, have, we cannot have people that are uh, children or criminals stealing guns out of people that think that they're safe with their guns. Sometimes they're not because they're being stolen. So I, I'm really, that's where I want to work towards. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. So personally, um, likewise, I haven't really done uh, anything to change policy on my own. But what I would do uh, as a council member is work to promote uh, stronger background checks and, of course, thinking about issues of gun violence as being very like comprehensive. So also um, promoting different mental health service uh, opportunities uh, and making those available to people. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. So. Um, what was your position on rent control when it was voted on in 2021? And has your position changed since then? And also, because we have two of them aren't here, if you want to contrast your answers, if you know, you know, we don't, the other two aren't here. We don't know what they think about this. But if you could contrast your answer perhaps to the other candidates, that would be good. What was your, did you vote for it or not? And what's your position now? So originally I was in favor of it. Um, since then it's changed. Uh, and so I'll say I agree with it in terms of the spirit of what was passed, but in terms of the details, there's a lot of details that we don't, we're still unaware of what exactly they mean and how they'll operate. And so again, we have exemptions in that, you know, allow land own, uh, um, that allow um, uh, 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 landlords to recoup between three and 8%. Uh, and for the moment, there's no clarity as to how you get between three and 8%. And so I think that one of the main things for me is having some clarity about where, we, where those numbers come from. How is it that we arrived at 3%? Since the original moment when that was passed, we've seen we've had a, a, an event of really extreme inflation. And so right now the inflation rate is actually it out uh, paces 3%. And so you're asking landlords to incur a real loss. I think that we have to take that into consideration. Times have changed a little bit and they've started to show us that um, perhaps that 3% number isn't um, what we thought of originally. And so I think that there's some need to reflect on what that would look like. And then also, again, get more clarity about what those exemptions look like. For my understanding, uh, a lot of that is done through a, um, a self-administrated self process. And so we don't know what exactly that legal structure looks like, who are the different agencies that are going to carry that out, and then to what extent it can actually work properly. And so I think those are all valid reasons to be pretty skeptical of it until we get a better understanding of how it'll work. Ms. Tollison, did you vote for it? Uh, yes, and I agree with everything David said, and I think it's something that we need to keep an eye on, and we have 
data. We have to uh, pay attention to the exemptions. We want to make sure that uh, the exemptions are used properly and that it's not used as a way to get renters out. So I think we need to take some time to evaluate it. Um, and that's about it. I, I'm, for right now, I'm okay. Let's keep an eye on it. Yeah, good. All right, starting with Ms. Tellefson. Uh, what is the most effective way to create affordable housing? And please be specific of any particular programs. How to create affordable housing, okay. Well, we, I think we need to, first off, I think that we really need to look at the housing vouchers and the income thresholds. Sometimes people will um, say that they are trying to get help with their rent, but they make too much, or it's, um, I just think that we need to, to do that. We need to be able to rehouse, use property, um, we don't always have to build. We can rehouse. And I'm sorry I'm kind of uh, stumbling on here because I had it in my brain earlier today, actually. And I'm going to end it and hear well, David. I'm not going to let you quite end it. Oh. Because, uh, here, here you go. No. I'm sorry. No, well, no, that's pick okay. my brain. Pick that's my brain. Okay. Have you heard of the Rondo Community Land Trust? Do you know what that is? I, you might, don't have to. I mean, it's. But well, tell what me, I'm what thinking you know. it is is that the Rondo area, they take ownership of the land. Yeah, so it's citywide. It started in Rondo, but it's citywide. And the community owns the land, and the family buys the house on top of the land, but that takes a lot of the cost out of buying a house, okay? And when um, you go to sell that house, you have to offer it to the community first at a limited equity price, so you can make some money on having your investment instead of being a renter, you get your money back when you go to sell, but it's limited so it stays affordable for the next family that wants to move in. And um, it's a really good program. And you know, I'm, we, this is the fifth of, uh, of six of these and I'm getting more and more ad-libbing on this kind of stuff and excuse me for doing that. But um, when I was in the legislature, I started the land trust movement here in Minnesota. So well, keep, it, the, keep that in mind when you get elected. I, okay? I did have this on my notes, what you just said. I didn't say Rondo, but I know we have community trust, but I seriously had a brain so thank That's you. That's all right. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. Well, so I love the land trust idea right from the start. My question has always been about, you know, how scalable that is and then also where the money comes from to make those initial investments. And so I love the idea, though. I love it. And I've heard of kind of isolated projects for uh, for making that work. That's not to detract any in any way, but just to say those are kind of my initial reflections on that. We're up to over 100 houses that we got in St. Paul going under it. And uh, right on. the payments that people make for buying their house from the land trust get plowed into getting the next one ready to go. So right we're doing good. I fully support that. And I'll, I'll add and then my two cents. So a few other things. One is there has to be a fundamentally a change in really the underlying ethos and spirit about uh, you know what type of deals we want with developers. And so my general sense is that the city of St. Paul has been pushing an idea of all development is good development, um, which to me, it sounds a lot like supply side economics. It's this idea that as long as we're building something, eventually it's gonna bring costs down for everybody. And what we've seen is really that doesn't work. We end up with a city of expensive condos um, and that's not criticizing that they're ugly. It's just saying that a lot of them are unaffordable. They're producing gentrification for a lot of our communities. People are speaking about that and nothing's changing. We're not getting affordability from this model of development. It's broken. Um, so one part that comes out of that is just brokering better deals, making sure that we have very clear what are the values that we want for housing in the city of St. Paul and doing our best to work with developers because they're fundamentally the main project partners and so you have to work with them to try and bring, in, uh, bring them in and get them on board for creating a real uh, vision of affordability. Beyond Next that, I have a few others. Can I add sure, some? Go. So the other one too that I think a lot of people don't talk about um, is property taxes. And so this year alone, we have a property tax increase of about 15%. One of the quickest things that you can do to stop 
our rents from increasing is to stop, is to really limit the use of property taxes each year. So if you increase property taxes 15%, what is the landlord doing? They're looking at that and they're saying, hey, my costs, I've just started, you know, I've gone, now I'm paying 4,000, now it's gonna be 4,000 plus 15% of that a year. Well, I need to recoup my costs and so I'm going to put that onto the renter. So a quick way to stop that from happening is not to say don't use property taxes, but we can't keep relying on this model of raising property taxes by up to 15%. That's really harming uh, renters and exactly the people that we're supposed to be uh, most concerned about. Okay, so that leads right to the next question, and it's uh, how do we uh, protect our existing tax base? How do we build our tax base? Um, whether you're voting for the 1% sales tax increase on the ballot coming up, but Having all those things in mind, uh, there's a TIF question, tax increment financing question I want to ask. And I sure hope that whoever wins this race has a good understanding about TIF and how it works. But it's not easy. I had to have my instructor on TIF write out this very long question because I'm not sure I even get it. So listen carefully. As a city council member, you'll be making decisions on the financial health of the city government services and resources. You will not only make decisions regarding the city's annual budget and property tax rate, but also its borrowing power and government bond rating. These are all aspects of the city's fiscal integrity, its ability to raise money to pay for the public services it provides. One important financial tool the city uses is tax increment financing, or TIF. This is a financial tool, tool that a city can use when A, an area is declared to be blighted, and B, when a developer can certify that a development project would not go forward but for the tax increment financing help. Here's mm -hmm. how it works. One, when a community designates, designates properties as a TIF district, the property value of those properties at that point in time are designated as the base value. For a set amount of years, usually 20 to 25 years, the property taxes over and above that base level goes into a separate fund so the city can incentivize or give a grant to the developer to allow the developer to reduce that amount of equity the developer must bring to the table, upfront money. The city then sells TIF bonds to borrow the projected increased property tax money upfront to grant to the developer for the development project. When the development project is completed, the increase in property taxes over the base amount is used to pay off the bonds. And my question, but remember, I also talked about how do we protect our existing tax base and how do we increase our tax base and how do we get the revenue the city needs. My question, what do you see as the pros and cons of using TIF in the short term to aid private development and in the long term as it affects the city's financial health? Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. So the, I mean, the immediate pro is, yeah, I mean, if, if you take this but for clause seriously, <laughs> It's telling us that if it weren't for TIF, uh, we wouldn't have these um, developments, we wouldn't have investments in our city. And so if we, you know, to the extent that we believe that, um, you know, we are replacing blighted properties and uh, improving upon them. And so that's one way of thinking about, about the benefit from that. In terms of the cons though, I mean, I think there are many, like one of the most immediate one, it, it, it seems so obvious is like, if you are, uh, if you are not, requiring these development projects and these developers uh, to pay property taxes, or rather you are creating a separate fund and you are siphoning this money into that fund to be in rent reinvested into the developments or into these projects, you're missing out on taxes, right? That's a source of revenue. And depending on how frequently, how often you use TIF as a way to attract in uh, investors, you might be really, um, incurring a loss then relative to the kind of the other uh, way of thinking about it. So the counterfactual, which would be that we're collecting revenue in the form of property taxes from these, uh, from these developments. That's pretty huge. And so I think what I've heard, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think that we have about 75 uh, TIF districts in St. Paul now. And so this idea has expanded well beyond what it was originally intended for. Uh, and again, it kind of depends on how we view these ideas. You know, what is a blighted property and to what extent are we creating different uh, investments in the city that otherwise wouldn't be there. And I think that in general, people have been pulling the wool over our eyes and using this uh, more frequently than we should. 
Ms. Thompson, do you think that, uh, I know you're ready to go, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching the TV, and yeah, I'm okay, like, all ready. No, no, so um, do you think that uh, the Ford plant site, do you think that the Allianz field site were never going to get developed unless we gave them TIF money? You're reading my mind, because that's what I was thinking of is the Ford plant. And why would that have been, why would have that been considered a blighted property? Why not look at Kmart? over on Maryland and 35E that's been empty for six years, 13 acres of land, and is a blighted property. Um, anyways, I, I don't like the idea of all this for years and years to come for, the, for our future citizens, residents of St. Paul. I don't like having them to carry such a burden on um, properties that really didn't need to have the TIF. And I do agree that if something truly is blighted, um, but I disagree with the Ford, for sure. The Alliance, I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure that land was blighted or not, but I don't believe Ford was. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, this question is direct first uh, with Ms. Tullison. In 2018, the city council approved an interim parking permit to the Alliance Stadium site for development. Besides the stadium is a sea, a sea of vacant parking lots. Recently, the city council has approved a uh, new parking permit. What is your thoughts of the current stadium site and how will you make developers keep their promises? I'm gonna be honest. I'm not real familiar with the uh, ins and outs around aliens. I've never been there, to be honest. I do know that there is a problem with the parking. I, I hear that. Uh, if I was a city council person, I'm going to get to know it. And I'm going to do what needs to be done. That's Mr. all I have. Uh, Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. I don't know how you fix that problem in the immediate term. I mean, I live relatively close to that area and I pass those parking lots all the time. And to me, they look terrible. And I think a lot of people have pointed out that we were promised something. We were promised a development for that entire Midway area. Um, and for the moment, what we have are really atrocious looking parking lots. Um, how you get developers to fulfill their end of the bargain on that, I'm not sure how you do that. You know, I think part of the the, pro, uh, the problem with this is, again, it goes back to the earlier part of overextending uh, TIF um, and um, bringing people in and not necessarily creating the type of uh, structures of accountability that you would want. And so I, I don't have a great answer. I think that it's a, a bit of a, a bind for the council, and I'm not sure how best you deal with it. Candidate Greenwood Sanchez, what <laughs> one word would you choose to best capture your campaign? Fun, determined, or diverse? Uh, uh, determined. All right, Ms. Towson. Determined. All right, good. All right, so, <laughs> yes. So, uh, Ms. Towson, uh, do you support the Summit Avenue re Regional Trail and bike Bikeway? Why is St. Paul at war with its trees? I do not support it as it is stands right now. And what was the question? Why are we at war with yeah, the Yeah, why are we tearing down trees all over town? Why aren't we doing one for one plus one replacements? Why don't we have the, when and the we'll, owners take care of their own trees mm -hmm. and their yard, we don't let them do that and preserve it that way. Instead, come and cut them down on them and so on. And, and then why does the city put in trees that uh, end up dying and they're mm -hmm. the lackluster trees? Uh, so first off, I don't, I don't like the plan. It's not just about the trees. Um, the trees are huge. The city says it's only going to take down a couple hundred, and then you have Save Our Streets, say over a thousand. Why is there such a, a big difference in amount? Um, the trees, I have heard when I'm door knocking, you wouldn't believe how many people show me their boulevard and say, the city took down that tree and see what they put in there as a, this tree and it died. I don't understand what's so difficult about p putting in trees that can grow. <laughs> Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. 
Yeah, so I, I oppose that project. Uh, I mean, in general, I think Summit obviously needs to be uh, repaved. Um, I think that's a starting point. But for the bike portion of it, I'll mention that I used to use Summit every day. I used to bike from Seward in Minneapolis to the Capitol building in St. Paul. And I absolutely love Summit Avenue for biking. And I'll say that there are a lot of bikers like myself who truly value Summit because it serves as kind of an expressway. You get a clean shot across the city that I don't know that we have any other bike lane that provides that um, and that's so accessible. Um, I think we need to have with this idea of, of having diversity, we also have to have a diversity of bike lanes. I don't think that every single one has to be the same. I think that we should offer some that are conducive for people who are exactly in that situation of trying to make it from one of the city to the other. Um, beyond that, what I see happening with the project is really unfortunate because one, again, I'm saying that some of the benefits are really questionable. I think we see it from many bike enthusiasts like myself. More importantly, we see it from neighbors around the Summit Avenue and beyond. People are speaking out against it. You saw it with a city council member where so many people showed up and they got outcast. They were really set aside and said, no, you guys are nimbiers. You guys are rich white people along Summit Avenue, and therefore you guys don't have a voice. You shouldn't be here, get out of here. And mm -hmm. I think that's fundamentally the wrong way about, of doing it. You know, as a political scientist, I believe, and really just as a person and as a resident of my city, I believe that everybody has a voice and that's irrespective of where you live, where you grow up, et cetera. And so what I see happening in Summit is, is really tragic. And then the other part, just to, to finish off, the bike lane portion of it is going to cost an extra $12 million that the city doesn't have. I mean, already we're talking about raising the sales tax another 1%. We clearly have shown that we don't have the capacity to do this, yet we're talking about this project that is an absolute extra. It doesn't need to be done. And then to add a little bit more, of course, we're going to go in and we're going to destroy, we're going to kill about a thousand, upwards of a thousand trees, depending on who you, um, which experts you trust. Um, yeah, that's problematic all around. I'm not going to talk about it any longer. It really Thank upsets you. me, especially sure. for so many of us who are, you know, from the city and we we understand how, uh, you know, how important that uh, Mr. Greenwood that lane oh, is for us. No, no, no. Oh, oh, okay. We're getting close to closing time, right. but there's a couple more questions I want to get to first. Okay, Start with Mr. Greenwood Sanchez. So, um, do you support the mayor's veto of the council member Necker's proposal? to tax everybody 50 cents a day to pay child care subsidies to the child care providers so that more moms and dads on low incomes can get child care. Yeah, yeah. You I, support I, the veto. I support the veto, yes. Um, in my case, it's a, a policy where we don't have the full details about how it's going to take place. I think that on top of it, in general, when we're talking about long-term projects that are dealing with some taxes that are pretty significant, that we ought to be very sure that this project is being funded correctly, that it's going to work effectively and efficiently, and we don't have those details yet. It's very much um, abstract, in my opinion. And so that's not to say that I'd support a veto always and under every condition, but from what I've seen so far, I think that the veto was appropriate. Yeah. Ms. Tolleson, so uh, the city council went and overrode that veto. In fact, there's going to be a vote on this uh, coming up in the next mm -hmm. election. Not this one, but future. Are you going inclined to vote yes to do that 50 cents a day on everybody or not? No, I'm not going to vote for that. At this time, that's what I believe. I think that we need to look at the state's uh, child care assistance programs. I think we have to change the the threshold for income so that people get more help with their daycare through the state. I think it's too much at this time with the way the property taxes have been going up, it's just going to be another thing that will drive people. Not just about the money, it's just, it's the fact that we could keep getting their taxes raised. Um, and as David said, we don't have all the information. Who, who, what kind of daycares? Who's, who's going to be covered? We need to have more information. Thank you. Okay. I think last question, and then we'll do the closes. So uh, first, uh, Mr. Greenwood Sanchez, uh, do you support the uh, restoration and redevelopment of historic resources in St. Paul? Uh, are, are you in favor of historic preservation? 
Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm absolutely in, in favor of historic preservation. That's not a blanket statement. It does depend on each individual site, but I think that in general, if you look uh, across the city, especially in recent years, the city has taken the opposite approach, which has been really to devalue our historic properties, um, our buildings, and things that beyond the, uh, my, one of my uh, key points that I'd like to mention is that beyond the, the historic value or the value of architecture and the building itself, that a lot of these buildings, especially when they are historic, when they've been around in a part of our city for so long, they carry deep meaning for residents. Um, I know that from experience because of uh, I grew up and, and lived really close, really close to the former St. Andrew's Church building that was destroyed not long ago. And I see a similar thing that plays out across the city. Right now we're seeing something similar for the Hamlin Midway Library. And again, it's important to realize that these sites, some of them are, you know, they're, they're symbolic, they're emblematic, they represent a community and their spaces where many things have happened that are very central to the lived experiences, the daily lives, and um, the people themselves. So I absolutely support a change to our general approach towards historic preservation in the city of St. Paul. And in general, yeah, I'm absolutely supportive of historic preservation. Thank you. Ms. Towson. I support historic preservation, of course. And I also think we need to make sure that the buildings that we preserve are being reused. We don't just want to have a building just to have a building. I think that it can uh, provide a lot of entertainment. Um, there's many buildings around the Waldman building over off West 7th. It's wonderful. And I think we need to to keep what we have. Right now, the Como Pavilion is, I know, being looked at as having some major changes. I know it's the exact replica of the original. Um, I think we really have to look carefully when that subject gets closer. So I do believe in historic preservation. Thank you both. Uh, and you know, it's just so important to have people running for office willing to put their lives out there, devote that time. And I want to thank you both for being candidates. Mr. Greenwood Sanchez, you start the uh, one minute closes. One minute close. Um, so I hope you'll vote for me. Again, I'm a, a longtime resident of, uh, really a lifelong resident of St. Paul, and I love my city, and I love politics, but the vision that we have for the city right now, it's not one that I can get behind. Again, we have ideas like we're told to get excited about uh, destroying our historic buildings, about cutting down our trees, about paying more taxes, and we're not seeing the basic things that we all care about, like, for example, paying our firefighters for um, fixing our roads in a reasonable way, for getting back to the basics, really things that we want. Instead, we're getting pitched all of these really grandiose projects. I'll second Pam's idea about the Como Pavilion being another one. We don't have money to fix our roads, but at the same time, we're talking about uh, expanding the Como Pavilion in order to better meet the needs of a restaurant in the inside of it. And then some of this stuff is getting really ridiculous and I think a lot of people, including myself, are uh, quite mad about that. And so we need a better vision for St. Paul and I hope that you uh, help me out by voting for me. Thank you, Ms. Towson. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The city keeps voting in the same people that think the same, we shouldn't have that. City council should have diversity in thought, not just in being female, color. I want to come to the table and say, I want to work with people. I'm a team player. I think we can get done if we can have communication. But we just cannot keep having these grand plans. Those are wonderful, but they're dreams sometimes. We need to take care of our streets. That's what people care about. Basic needs, safety streets, sidewalks, trash, and the snow plowing. How many times have I heard about snow plowing? Um, if I'm your city council person, I'm gonna be there. That's one of my characteristics of my gift is that I have empathy for people and being a city council person, that's what's really important is not just, it's the phone call Thank and you. I'll answer. All right, All right. great, great job you guys, thanks a lot. That's the end of this forum. All right, this is fun.